Hello, welcome to the bird watching channel. This is part two of a four part series about ruby throated hummingbirds. We'll be talking about their migration and nesting. I'm your host and fellow bird watcher, Sharon Sorensen. Ruby throated hummingbirds endure a death defying migration twice a year. Wintering in Central America, where you see blue marked on this map, migrating across the Gulf of Mexico into the basically eastern half of the United States and even into the southern reaches of Canada, the areas marked in red. There they come to breed. In January, hummers begin leaving Costa Rica, and by the last week of February, they start leaving the Yucatan Peninsula of Mexico and arriving along the Gulf Coast of the United States. Now, they don't migrate in flocks. If they did, and they all ran into a major storm, for instance, over the Gulf, the entire population could be obliterated. So, as Robert Sargent said in his book, Ruby-Throated Hummingbirds, wave after wave of ruby throats depart the Mexican Peninsula over a three-month period in a protracted migration that extends from late February until the first week of May. Now, if you were to fly directly from Merida, Yucatan to Panama City, Florida, that'd be about 679 miles, but hummingbirds don't necessarily arrive and depart from those specific areas, so most references say the flight across the Gulf is about 500 miles. So let's do the math about what that means to a hummingbird. Most estimates also suggest that hummingbirds fly about 25 miles an hour at cruising speed. So it takes them about 20 hours then to cross the Gulf of Mexico. That is if they don't have headwinds, which could add to that time, but then tailwinds could reduce it. And they beat their wings about 70 times per second, and so 60 seconds in a minute, 4,200 wing beats per minute, 3,600 seconds in an hour, so 252,000 wing beats per hour, 72,000 seconds in 20 hours, 5,040,000 wing beats to cross the Gulf. I don't have to tell you, do I, that's nonstop. There's no place to stop, no place to eat, no place to rest, no place to refuel. And as Sargent says, ruby throats depart from the area of the Yucatan near dusk and fly nonstop through the night and into the next afternoon before arriving all along the northern Gulf Coast from central Florida to southern Texas. So how can they survive such an ordeal? They must double their weight. Look at the fat rolls on this bird. Now, yes, there are some alternate migration routes. A few of the birds actually go up through Mexico and then fly along the eastern ridge of the Rocky Mountains. Most of them, however, cut directly across the Gulf of Mexico, while a few others go into Cuba, cut into Florida, go up the east coast. But no matter where they go, they confront storms, they confront cold fronts, they have north winds, they have food shortages, and somehow they must try to survive all of this ordeal. Ironically, though, in spite of the ordeals that they face, the first birds to arrive on the coast arrive almost every year within a few days that last week of February. Now again, this isn't all of them. These are the first to arrive. By the time they refuel, fatten up a little bit, recover from their flight, and move on, by the time they get to northern Kentucky and southern Indiana, we're looking at the early to mid-April. The males arrive first, and they often return to the same area. They look for a territory of up to 20 square yards, maybe even an acre. And that all depends, of course, on the food supply. They arrive prime and then deteriorate because they are involved in territorial battles. You've seen it at your feeders. You know how they fight one another. And you see this kind of aggressive posture frequently in this early spring. The females also arrive a few weeks later, but they return to their ancestral site religiously. They return where they were born. 
They may even refurbish the same nest, although in most cases the weather has destroyed the nest by the time they return. She determines the food supply, she builds the nest while the eggs are still maturing her body, and when the nest is complete, then she seeks a mate. And that nest is an awesome thing. It's built of thistle and dandelion down with rootlets. It's attached by spider webs, and it's covered with sap, which is then absorbed into the nest and dries and makes a really firm nest. When she's finished with that nesting, she selects the meanest, most aggressive male she can find. She wants to pass on strong genes to her kids. So they breed on a neutral territory, not his, not hers, but someplace neutral. And it happens with the male performing a shuttle display where he flies back and forth in an arc, trying to impress her with his prowess and flash that beautiful gorget to her to show her how beautiful he is. If she's impressed, they mate. If she's not, she flies off for a better choice. That finished nest is a tiny thing, as you can see, compared to this number two pencil. And by its very tiny size, is fairly readily camouflaged but notice that it is completely camouflaged by the lichen that's attached to it. One of the most interesting things about that nest, though, is its sidewall. It has a very thin elastic top, and the elasticity is necessary because as the babies grow, they need more room. So you'll see that nest band in this breeding female simply because that elastic top fits so snugly against her feathers. So the egg laying and incubation begin. She lays two pea-sized eggs that they hatch in about two weeks and she leaves only to feed. And that may be no more than 15 seconds because you know, in the cold, in the early spring, when we often have those cold spells, she really can rarely leave that nest she would lose maybe 15 to 20 percent of her body weight during that time. She can't go into torpor because obviously if her body temperature would drop then she wouldn't be keeping the eggs fertile and so some of them just don't make it. Once she finishes the first nesting and that nest gets a little dilapidated she builds a new nest and starts her second nest. And the sad news is that only 20% of hummingbirds survive their first year. But when I say survive the first year, I'm talking about from the time the egg is laid until the birds fledge, until they fly to Costa Rica, until they return from Costa Rica. So a full year and all kinds of hazards await them during that time. The fall migration comes around triggered by length of day. The males leave first because obviously once their second breeding is complete, they have no purpose. And the females may still be feeding young at that point. In fact, they could still be on the nest at that point. And so youngsters end up making that first migration alone, not with an adult and not with other youngsters, literally alone, because the route and the destination or hardwired into their brains at birth. So it's a myth, it's important to point this out, it's a myth that hummingbirds won't migrate as long as they can find feeders. As long as there are hummingbirds around, they need your feeders. So let's take a look at exactly how this calendar of events works out. The first to second, third week of April, the females arrive and check out the food supply, check out nest sites, and by early May, they're building their nests. It takes them about a week and selecting mates. By mid-May, in the pale blue, they lay their eggs and incubate for two weeks. By late May, in the darker blue, they begin feeding their broods. They feed their broods for about three weeks. So by the end of June, they feed their fledglings and build new nests and find mates. And it's at this point when the fledglings first, the first brood of fledglings leave the nest that you start seeing more uh, birds at your feeders. 
by the first part of July, she's incubating her second brood and begins feeding those, uh, brood, that brood at the end of July. By early August, the second broods fledge. And so you start seeing another uptick of birds at your feeders. So they feed those fledglings, the females feed those fledglings another week or so, and then they start eating. And the migrants start moving through. By September, it's peak migration time. Everyone is at the feeders, the first broods, the second broods, moms and dads, although many of the dads, of course, have already gone by this time, the first brood migrants, the migrating adults that have come down from, say, the southern parts of Canada. And so it's crazy busy at the feeders. This is the peak time for hummingbird feeders. With few exceptions, as Bob Sargent says, starting in mid-July, all of the birds seen at feeders one day are gone the next, replaced by new birds. Banding studies indicate, for instance, that a large number of migrant ruby throats pass through the same yards on the same day, year after year, with staggering numbers in August and September. And that's an incredible fact, indicates how clearly their clock works how careful the timing is, always governed by length of day. So then obviously the juveniles are the last to leave. Not only do they know when to leave and what direction to head, they apparently recognize their winter grounds when they arrive there. That's all hardwired into their brains as handed down from the DNA from their parents. So what we need to do in case there are any late lingering hummingbirds is keep our feeders out until Christmas. Youngsters who have not quite found their way yet or who have not quite developed the strength to leave are going to be the last ones through and they're going to be the ones most desperate for food. And sure, if it ices up, then you have to bring your feeders in to get them from uh, keep them from being broken. But hey, this picture was taken December 6th in southern Indiana, and there's no question that's a hummingbird. So they do come through. We don't necessarily see them, but they do need us. And this is on the advice of the non-game bird biologists with the DNR in Indiana. So I hope you've enjoyed this section on migration and nesting about the ruby-throated hummingbirds. And I hope you'll stay tuned for the part three about threats and predators and part four then will be about attracting hummingbirds to your feeders. So meanwhile, I hope you enjoy lots of hummingbirds in your feeders and in your yard and may you always have birds in your binoculars.